First of all, thank you as always to our Platinum Corporate Partners. Their support of this event is very much appreciated. They have been key partners for us and have a lot of great things going on. You see the Platinum Partners as well as our other partners rolling across the screen. Um, we will, there is more from them and some of the relevant work that they're doing on our website. We will also have a chance to hear from a lot of them at our upcoming Lunch and Learn. We will reconvene Lunch and Learns later this month, so look for more on that um, election follow-up updates, legislative updates as we go into the legislative session, and a lot of other great information to discuss there. This webinar is going to be recorded, so for anyone that is unable to view it, we will have the option to access that later. We'll also be live tweeting, so if you'll follow us at at Fast Growth Texas, you'll be able to follow us there. Of course, we're happy and excited to be a part of the TASA TASB conference, and so if you want to use the TASA TASB hashtag, that's available as well. Okay, let's get this started. Dr. Killian, the president of Fast Growth School Coalition and superintendent at Hoogerville ISD, will introduce our speaker. Dr. Killian, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kate. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. If you're like me, you love hearing from his insight. And actually, I, was, I had the pleasure of being on a panel he moderated um, about a year or so ago on the Finance Commission work. And I can attest that he definitely asked the hard questions and gets the information out that you wanna hear at any event he's involved in. Of course, I'm talking about Evan Smith. Uh, Evan is the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, a pioneering nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news organization whose deep coverage of Texas politics and public policy can be found on its website, the thetexastribune.org, or texastribune.org, in newspapers, on TV and radio stations across the state, as well as in print, and online editions of the Washington Post. Since its launch in 2009, the Tribune has won international acclaim and numerous awards, including a Peabody Award, 21 National Edward R. Morrow Awards from the Radio Television News Association, and three General Excellence Awards from the Online News Association. Um, Evan is also the host of, of Overheard with Evan Smith, a weekly half hour interview program that airs on PBS stations around the country. Previously, he spent nearly 18 years at Texas Monthly, including eight years as the mag magazine's editor and a year as its president and editor in chief. I would add that he just wrapped up the, their Texas Tribune Festival, another successful virtual event by the Trib. Please welcome Evan Smith. <clears throat> Doug, thank you so much. It is so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Greg Smith. Thank you, Fast Growth Schools Coalition for having me back. It is so great to be with you always. And I must say, I'm, I'm talking to you on the day that I thought would never come, the day when I was finally surprised by something during the Trump administration. I have spent the last four years waking up every day saying, okay, my capacity to be astonished has been exhausted. Um, and uh, finally, uh, uh, this week, today, with the news of the president's and the first lady's diagnosis for, uh, as positive for the coronavirus, uh, I, I'm just, I, I don't have words. I'm, I'm wordless. I'm speechless. Um, I had a presentation for you that I'm going to show you that's going to talk through the, the, you know, where we think the elections are today and where we think the elections may be headed uh, a little bit more than 30 days after election day. But honestly, what I'm gonna show you is largely irrelevant because we have never had a situation like the one that we find ourselves in today where the president and the first lady are both um, sick. Even if they're not showing significant symptoms, they are sick with, a, uh, with, with what is a, a potentially fatal uh, disease. Um, the president uh, is apparently doing okay. First lady's doing okay. Uh, we have some other people in government who have tested uh, positive, a whole bunch of tested negative, but we don't have a playbook for this. We don't have a predicate for this. There is absolutely no way to know what this is going to do to the election, to politics, and to the governance of this country. Uh, uh, really, we ought, ought to keep our eyes focused on the most important thing, which is what does this mean for all of us and for America? This is not about an election. It's about issues that are significantly larger than that. But um, it's very difficult not to see what is staring us right in the face, and that is that we have a presidential election, what was already going to be the most momentous presidential election in, in, in the modern era of this country. Um, 
some say going back to the 1860s. Um, that was happening already. And then we have this turn of events now. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm stunned by it. And I think probably all of you on this call are stunned by it, processing it as it happens. I am going to share my screen. I'm going to show you some slides, as I said. Uh, and we're going to then talk through the elections. But I want to leave a lot of time on the back part of this, if you don't mind, for, um, for your questions for me. Because I think there's a lot that we're probably talking through together and working through together here in this moment. Um, just to amplify what Doug said for a second, you know, the Tribune has been in business for 11 years. We started the Tribune in November of 2009 because we believed there were not enough news organizations in Texas and not enough reporters in Texas who were telling everyday Texans, regular folks in this incredibly important and interesting state that we love, what is going on? What are the facts? What is happening in the worlds of politics and public policy? The premise then and the premise now is that a more informed and a more engaged Texas is a better Texas. Texas is better when more of its citizens are aware of what's happening around them, of the fights being waged on their behalf and the stakes they have in the outcomes of those fights, not just at election time, but at all times. So we built a news organization from the ground up. We are now nearly 100 strong at the Tribune. We have the most reporters at a state capital of any news organization for profit or nonprofit in the country for the eighth consecutive year. We believe that Texas is big and the issues that start here, originate here, migrate out to the rest of the country are big and important. And as a result, uh, we need to deploy uh, uh, as many reporters, as much in the way of resources as we can to tell these really critical stories for all of you. Doug uh, said also that the Tri Tribune Festival had just ended. That was a 30-day virtual refresh of what typically is our weekend-long ideas conference. This was to have been the 10th year of the Tribune Festival. It, well, it was the 10th year, but it was the first year of it as a virtual event. We had 300 speakers. We had 120 sessions over the course of the month. Here you can see one of those, which was a conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, but there was so much in the realm of education. I know you all care principally, not only, but principally about that. And I will tell you that the education content we did for the festival this year was absolutely terrific. Um, you can go on to the festival website, festival.texastribune.org. If you were a ticket buyer uh, during the month of September, you can go back and look at everything. It'll be available until October 6th. If you were not a ticket buyer, you can buy a ticket after the fact and have the run of our content for all that time. And if you decide not to buy a ticket, if you were not one after October 5th, there are 45 sessions from the festival, roughly one third of the event will be available on YouTube in perpetuity. So hopefully you can catch up on that. Today's conversation is going to be, and again, it's been derailed to some degree by the news overnight, but uh, today's conversation uh, is going to be was going to be the state of play in a state in play. And no one is more surprised than I am to be describing Texas as a state in play. Every two years, every four years, we hear, oh, this is the time that Texas is finally going to go from red to purple or purple to blue. If, if like me, you remember the recent history of Texas, you know that it was 1994, that the last, uh, as the last year, a Democrat was elected in Texas statewide. No Democrats elected statewide since 1994. And the legislature of Texas has been majority Republican in both the House and the Senate for, you know, more than 15 years or going on 15 years at least. And with margins that don't even give the Democrats a chance to get back in the conversation, roughly supermajority up until the last election cycle in the House and supermajority roughly in the Senate. So it's a Republican state. And so the idea that Texas is suddenly going to one day go from red to blue or even abruptly from red to purple and then purple to blue has been something that I have resisted uh, for many, many years. I'm kind of like the last guy airlifted off the roof of the hotel at the end of the war. I mean, I just do not believe the war is over. Uh, and, and yet here I am saying to you with a straight face and a pure heart about 30 days out from the election, that the state is legitimately in play, even though we don't know what the headlines are going to be on November 4th. I would observe that the fact that we are 30 days out and do not know with certainty what the headlines are going to be on November 4th is itself news, because I can't think of a cycle in recent memory when this close to an election, we did not know with certainty what would happen. So if you pay attention to no other slide today, pay attention to this slide. This is the so-called order of probability slide for what's going to happen on election day. 
there are really four bits of business in our book of business that, um, th that are happening on election day. There's uh, 36 congressional elections. Every member of the U.S. House from the Texas delegation is on the ballot or every race is on the ballot. There are some with, an, uh, with no incumbent because they've retired and so there are open seats, but there are 36 races on the ballot. All 150 Texas House races are on the ballot. Obviously, we'll have a presidential election in Texas as we will every and every other state in the country. And we happen to have a U.S. Senate race this time. It is John Cornyn, our senior senator, who is running for his fourth six-year term uh, uh, up for re-election on, uh, uh, on this ballot. And so these are really the books of business that we have, or the bits of business on the book of business that we have on November 4th. And the question is, from the standpoint of the order of probability, what is likeliest to happen and what is least likely to happen? This is the conventional wisdom, not just mine, but it surely is mine. But if you ask other people, they will tell you, this is the likely order of probability. Most likely, and we'll get to all of these things here on slides. Most likely order of probability is that the Democrats pick up some number of congressional seats, how many to be determined. Second most likely is that the Texas House flips from red to blue, a Republican control to Democratic control. Third most likely is that the presidential uh, race is decided in favor of the Democrat Joe Biden as opposed to the incumbent President Donald Trump. And the least likely of those four is that John Cornyn loses to MJ Hager, his Democratic opponent. So this is the order of probability. I'll also note that it is also probably one of these precondition lists. In order for the Texas House to flip, a precondition is that the Democrats win more congressional seats than they're expected to win. A precondition of Joe Biden beating Donald Trump in Texas is that both the Democrats win more congressional seats than we expect and the Texas House flips. And I don't see a scenario in which John Cornyn loses and the three things on the list above the Senate race don't happen also. So in some ways, it's like, you know, one is a necessary condition for two, two is a necessary condition for three, and one, two, and three are all necessary conditions for four. Let's talk about the presidential race, which again has been completely jolted by the news overnight. Um, you know, th this race has been remarkably stable over the course of the year. That is something to know. And to note is that the race has been remarkably stable. Um, this is the 538 website's aggregation of the polls, average of the polls aggregated over the course of this year up through and including today. These are the national polls, popular vote. And as you can see, there has not been a moment over the course of this year where the average of the polls aggregated showed the president ahead of Vice President Biden. Not a single moment. Have there been polls that have had the vice president behind the president? Yes. Um, have the trend lines narrowed? Yes. But where we sit today with the average in the polls, Biden at 51%, Trump at 42.7%, or an 8.2% margin, where we sit today is more or less, maybe it's a little bit more, than the average over the course of the year, but it is more or less where we have been. This race is stable. It is noteworthy for not being noteworthy in terms of the fluctuations. And look, we know what happened in 2016. Hillary Clinton was ahead of Donald Trump for most of the year. Her margin at this point four years ago was not this margin. It was significantly smaller. Uh, the only poll that matters is election day, right? The oldest cliche in the world in politics also is the truest cliche in the world. But a, a lead of 8.2% is pretty significant. Now, I will observe, this is a, an average of the polls of the popular vote. We do not elect presidents by the popular vote. If we elected presidents by the popular vote, if a slide like this really mattered, Al Gore and Hillary Clinton both would have been presidents. And the reason that they didn't win the election is because we elect presidents through an electoral college and not through the popular vote. We really don't have a national election. What we have is 50 state elections. So ignore the national polls. They are a little bit like the sports book in states where gambling is not legal. They're for entertainment purposes only, right? So you get down to saying, okay, well, what do the 50 state polls say? Honestly, let me revise what I said. We don't really have a 50 state election. I mean, technically we do. What we have is an election in about 11 or 12 states that are the ones that are in competition. Places like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, Florida, 
North Carolina, and all that. If you look at, and now I've switched from 538 to real clear politics. If you look at the aggregation of the, or the, pardon me, the listing of all of the individual state polls, what you see is that the president's got big problems in the states. There are states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and Pennsylvania, in fact, the most important states for him winning last time were those three states because those were states that Democrats had won for six consecutive presidential elections, and they were the difference for him uh, between losing and winning in 2016. In all of those state polls, Vice President Biden is not just ahead, but is ahead by a margin that almost puts it out of the margin of error and makes you think that there's really not any way that the president's going to come back. I mean, of course, anything can happen. The even bigger problem for the president is that in a whole bunch of other states that Democrats have not typically won, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, uh, even some states that were not on the Democrats' radar screen earlier, Iowa, Ohio, right? North Carolina, which President Obama won but is in the first ter term, but is typical, first election, but is typically a Republican state. President's losing every place. I mean, in, in the, it, w w if there are opportunities for the Democrats, the president is losing in the polls in every one of those states. This is the electoral map from 2016. <clears throat> of course, there are 538 electoral votes. You need 270 to win. And in this map, president won, as I said, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin for a total of 46 electoral votes. He won those three states by fewer than 100,000 votes combined. That's how close the election was. But because he won those three states, his electoral vote total was up at 306. If you subtract 46, the electoral votes in those three states from 306, he's at 260, he loses the election. So it really was those three states that made a difference. One theory of this election, it's getting a little bit old at this point, but one theory was that Pennsylvania and Michigan are the states of those three most likeliest or likely as pardon me, most likely to flip back to the Democrats, just the nature of the electorate there and Biden is not Clinton and, you know, the nature of the first four years of Trump, it's less, less likely, harder for him to win those states. And so of those three, Wisconsin is the Trumpiest of the upper Midwestern states in terms of the disposition of its electorate. And so people said, well, you know, he may lose Pennsylvania, Michigan, but as long as he wins Wisconsin and holds all of his other states, he's okay. Well, the math here really does bear that out. If he loses Pennsylvania and loses Michigan, but he holds on to Wisconsin, he wins a very, very close, razor thin margin election, 270 to 268, right? Now, a, a scenario that kind of counters that scenario is let's say Biden holds on to Pennsylvania, Michigan, Trump holds on to Wisconsin, but the only other state that Biden flips that Trump won is Florida, where Biden is doing well. Florida has been a very close state for many, many cycles. Trump beat Clinton in Florida by 1.2 percentage points. Obama beat Romney running for re-election in Florida by under a point. And of course, 20 years ago this fall was the famous hanging chat election between Bush and Gore, where Florida really was that close and really decided the outcome of the election. So what if we give Florida back to Biden, where he's generally been leading by three points, two points, four points, give that one to Biden, then even holding on to Wisconsin doesn't help the president. All of a sudden now Biden's at 297. In fact, you could even give the president back Pennsylvania. Biden's at 277. You give him back Michigan, the president's at 281. So Florida really would be a decider in this. And that is why you hear people say, for Biden, Florida is a nice to have. For Trump, Florida is a must win. Well, what if you forget about Florida but you give Biden those three upper Midwestern states in which he's ahead, and then you give Biden also the state that Trump won last time that Biden is, according to the polls, most likely to win, and that is Arizona. Well, Biden now has 289 electoral votes. Give Florida back to Trump. Just give Biden the upper Midwestern states and give him Arizona. Arizona is a state that has a very heavy, uh, has heavily Hispanic population, and it's been threatening to go blue for some time. In fact, it right now has one Democratic senator, Kirsten Sinema, and it may very well have another Democratic senator, Mark Kelly, who is way, way ahead of the incumbent, Martha McSally. Uh, and, you know, Arizona's polls uh, for the last six months have shown Biden ahead by some number of points to the extent that now the rating uh, uh, services, the sort of hotlines and the crystal balls in the world who are the best at rating, well, what do you think the state's going to do? They have it as a lean Democratic state.
So if you give him Arizona, now Biden's at 289. This is the map that has all the states. If you just said, let's take all the polls and let's give the, the person who is ahead in the polls today those states on election day, it would be a landslide for Biden. It'd be 375, 163. You give him not just the three states that Trump flipped, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, but you give Biden Ohio, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, Iowa. You give him the one congressional district in North, in, uh, in pardon me, in Nebraska, that is essentially its own island, which right now looks to be going Democratic. And you give the Democrats also, Biden, that one congressional district in Maine that's kind of its own island, which went for Trump last time, but looks to be going for the Democrat this time. You end up at 375 to 163. It is an absolute blowout. And look, I will just say that this is not potentially the extent of it. There was a Quinnipiac poll out the other day in South Carolina that had Trump up in South Carolina by one point on Biden, one point. Remember, South Carolina was where Biden recovered his campaign. Jim Clyburn, the congressman, endorsed him. It's a very heavy black population. They turned out in great numbers for Biden. Who knows? This thing could cascade. What happens in the last 30 days is that the trend occasionally just gives way. The wave becomes a tsunami. The tsunami becomes a Sharknado. And so you're all of a sudden looking at the possibility of the vice president being closer to 400 electoral votes. It would be an absolute landslide if that happened. Now, the one other slide I'm going to show you on the electoral map is what happens if somehow in the last 30 days, Trump gets back Pennsylvania, Mich Michigan, and Wisconsin in his column. He holds the one electoral vote in Maine. He holds Nebraska. He holds on to every other state, but the only state that flips is Texas. The only state. Look at the election if that happens. If Texas goes blue, if Trump holds every other state, Biden 270, Trump 268. Texas matters. That's why the Democrats say the minute that Texas goes from red to blue, it becomes an electoral lock for the Democrats every four years. You never want to actually say that because you never know what's going to happen. But you certainly understand why it's so important for them to get Texas because Texas really does change the calculation. Remember what happened in 2016, you guys. Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton by nine points. <clears throat> it was 52-43 Trump-Clinton. Hillary did not overperform. That's roughly the high watermark for Democrats over the last 20 years at the presidential level. Trump underperformed at 52. There were a bunch of Republicans and independents who voted Republican who, at this election, this guy, they went, I can't. And so they skipped Trump and they voted for other Republicans on the ballot. By comparison to this nine-point margin, in 2016, Mitt Romney beat Barack Obama by 16. John McCain beat Obama by almost 12 in 2008. You have to go back to 1976 when Jimmy Carter beat Gerald Ford by about three and a half points to find a Democrat winning Texas. So nine is not nothing. Nine is good, but nine is narrow. So you take that nine-point narrower than normal victory. And then you also factor in what happened in 2018 when Ted Cruz only beat Beto O'Rourke by 2.6 percentage points in the Senate race. O'Rourke got the most votes of any Democrat running statewide in the history of Texas. And Texas turned out 8.3 million people in a midterm election when turnout's supposed to be low. They get presidential year turnout. They get women, they get people of color, they get young people to turn out in extraordinary numbers, not all of them voting Democratic, but most of them. And so from the Democrats' perspective, they go, we kept it closer than double digits for the first time in ages in 2016. Look at what Beto did in 2018. We think we have an opportunity in 2020. Republicans are like, look, this is still a Republican state. It's still a conservative state. But you know what? Look at the polls in Texas. Look at the 538 aggregation of polls in Texas. The president is only up by two points. As I said, Jimmy Carter beat uh, Ford by three and a half points. Hubert Humphrey beat Richard Nixon in 1968 by about three points. I mean, you're talking about a race that is setting up to be the closest race in more than 50 years. In more than 50 years. Uh, now, I don't Personally, I mean, I'll, I, I, you know, my job is to kind of give you the facts, but I'm going to give you here a window onto my thinking on this, if you're interested. And that is, well, I've said this before. 
if Jose Altuve and Dak Prescott was the Democratic ticket, I don't think the Democrats would win Texas. I, I'm really going to need to be convinced in the last 30 days, unless the Republican brand and the president and everything just collapses completely. I, I can't see how the Democrats win at the presidential level. I absolutely can see how the Democrats keep this as close as Beto kept it to Trump and, and uh, to Cruz. What happens if this is a two-point race or a three-point race on election day? Well, that will only happen if the Democratic turnout is extraordinary, if the overall turnout in the election is extraordinary. And what happened in 2018, Beto lost at the top of the ticket, but they beat a bunch of down-ballot Republicans. That will happen in 2020 if the race is two points, three points. Is Biden will lose, okay, but the Democrats are going to pick up a bunch of congressional seats, probably more than they think. They're going to pick up a bunch of House seats, maybe take back the majority, and they're going to also do well um, in smaller uh, down-ballot races across the state. The congressional stuff to me is really interesting. And that is that, you know, for a long time, this was a two-thirds Republican, one-third Democrat uh, delegation, 36 seats uh, in the delegation in the U.S. House. And then in 2018, the Democrats picked up two seats in the two big urban counties, Harris County and Dallas County, which honestly, as counties, had gone blue. And so these two members of Congress, Republicans, John Culberson and Houston, Pete Sessions in Dallas, were kind of holding on for dear life all along. But Democratic opponents uh, really uh, uh, ran great campaigns in a cycle that was very good for Democrats and beat them. And then there were a whole bunch of other races in which Democrats came significantly closer to winning than they should have or they had historically, recent memory. And so Democrats made a decision, we're going to really invest in Texas and we're going to see if we can't flip a bunch of those seats. Again, right now, after 2018, the margin, it's 23 Republicans in the delegation and 13 Democrats. So there are generally accepted to be at least four seats where the Democrats have a pretty good chance of winning. The one that they have the best chance of winning in is actually the person who is pictured here, second from left, arms folded, Gina Ortiz Jones, who ran against Will Hurd in Texas 23 last time, even though Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump in the district by some number of points, she lost to Hurd by fewer than 1,000 votes. She said, I'm gonna run again. She announced she's running again, and then Hurd retires. So now it's an open seat. Look, in a presidential year, this district tends to turn out many more Democrats. It is widely believed that of all the congressional races, this is the one where the Democrats are almost certainly going to pick up a seat from the Republicans. That's the best chance. The next two best chances are to her left and right, Shri Kulkarni in Fort Bend County, Candace Valenzuela west of Dallas. The Kulkarni district is the old Pete Olson district. Like Heard, he retired. The Valenzuela race is the old Kenny Marchant district. Like Hurd and Olson, Marchant retired. They both have Republican opponents who are perfectly good. In fact, I think Valenzuela's Republican opponent, Beth Van Dyne, the former mayor of Irving, is a particularly good Republican candidate. But the demographics in those districts are destiny. And I think the Democrats have a very strong chance. It is not quite as good as Jones, but, but sort of next down the list. Skyrocketing to the top here with a bullet. Before too long, she may have a better chance, actually, than those two is Wendy Davis, the former state senator and former Democratic nominee for governor, who is running against Chip Roy, a freshman Republican member. This is a district that goes from Austin through the Hill Country down to San Antonio. Um, both Davis and, and Roy live in Austin, so there's that parody. Davis is obviously Wendy Davis, and Chip Roy, who is Ted Cruz's former chief of staff, uh, formerly is a very conservative member of the, of the House. This was a plus nine, plus 10 Republican district when Lamar Smith, the previous occupant, held it. There were some years that it was so Republican that Democrats didn't even bother to field the candidate. But Roy ran against a Democrat who was a pretty good Democratic candidate last time, Joseph Kopser, and he only won his race in 10 by, in a, pardon me, 21, District 1 by about three point, less than three points, about the same margin as Cruz and O'Rourke. So Democrats said, well, we're gonna go hard for this next time, and they got Wendy Davis to run, or she decided to run, and the thing is, it's tied right now. It's tied right now. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting to see the third quarter fundraising numbers. The money has been a huge issue for Democrats across the state. Traditionally, Republican candidates for the House outraised Democrats. This cycle, for the first time in years, Democrats have outraised Republicans. That tells you something about the confidence of donors and the quality of the Democratic candidates this time, relatively speaking, that that's happened. And look, money won't win you a race, but it puts ads on TV. It pays for mailers. It pays for yard signs. It does matter. 
In the second quarter, which ended at the end of June, Democrats were outraising their Republican opponents by crazy amounts. And let me tell you, um, it's not public yet, but apparently the Wendy Davis fundraising number in Q3, which just ended, is eye-popping, like epic, like a record. And you know what I keep hearing is they can't announce it because they're still counting it. It's taking this long to count it, but it's apparently going to be crazy. So we'll have to see what happens. But you know, in some of the other races, which are not thought to be as competitive, the Mike Siegel race against Mike McCall, the Republican incumbent, District 10, or Julie Oliver's race against Roger Williams, District 25, they've now over the last two days announced what are really for those races, not priority races, astounding numbers. Uh, amounts of money in Q3. So we'll see what happens. Uh, on the Texas House, before 2018, the Texas House was 95 Republicans, 55 Democrats. Democrats picked up 12 seats in the House in 2018. So now it's 83-67. They're within nine seats net of taking back control of the House, having the ability to elect a Democrat speaker heading into redistricting. And that's extraordinary. And you know everybody acknowledges that it's a possibility. I would say probably today, it is a little bit better than a 50% chance, depending upon how the last 30 days of the election go and how just, again, I want to say again, tie this to Trump and the Republican brand. If, if everything kind of comes unraveled in the next 30 days, then I think the chances for Democrats further down ballot increases. And the Democrats are, use, are, are really looking to using how Beto O'Rourke did last time as their guide. They've got 22 targeted seats in the House. These are the 22 seats. And they're saying, well, you know, in these seats, how did O'Rourke do compared to the Republican incumbent? In the first nine on the list, the ones that are reflected in blue on the right, those were seats in which the Republican incumbent in the legislature, in the House, won re-election or, or won election in the case of an open seat in 2018, but Beto O'Rourke beat Ted Cruz in the Senate race in that district at the same time. And in some of those races, it was significantly uh, the case that, that Beto beat uh, 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 Cruz. I mean, look at the Sarah Davis district in Houston. Sarah Davis won re-election by six and a half points last time over her Democratic opponent, who not incidentally is running again against her. But O'Rourke beat Cruz by 21 and a half points. There was a 28-point swing in that district. Look at Morgan Meyer and Angie Button in Dallas. The O'Rourke margin over Cruz in those districts was 15 points, 10 points, respectively. You know, the, the, of course, all these members are polling. How are Trump and Biden doing in our district held by a Republican? And the answer is that Biden is killing Trump in those districts. So... Those nine are the real targets. And then if you go down, the next 13 are ones in which by varying degrees, O'Rourke lost by a small margin to Cruz. Democrats think they've got a real shot and they don't worry so much about the seats that they won last time that Republicans are targeting. So we'll see what happens. Finally, on the Senate race, I'll tell you that um, John Cornyn got reelected in 2014 to his third term by 26 points. No way, no how is that happening this time. It's gonna be a much closer race. MJ Hager is the Democratic opponent. She was a congressional candidate, some acclaim around her candidacy in District 31 against John Carter last time. She made it a very, very close race. She has a terrific biography. Here's the problem. Cornyn is not Cruz. Hager is not Beto. I'm not even sure Beto would be Beto this time, right? And so Cornyn is, is running a couple of points ahead of Trump in every poll. And if you look at the polls in the Senate race, Cornyn has a reasonably comfortable lead. You know, if, if Trump wins Texas by two, I would expect Cornyn to win by six, right? Um, as I said earlier, I can't see how Cornyn loses if Trump wins. But I will say, again, back on the fundraising, MJ Hager raised $13.5 million in the third quarter of this year, eight times her previous best. Money is flowing into this race. And, you know, what happens in a race like this, which is not a priority race around the country, Colorado's a priority race, Arizona, this is for the National Democrats, Colorado Senate race, Arizona Senate race, Maine Senate race, North Carolina Senate race, two Georgia Senate races, Montana Senate race. If, if the whole thing essentially, if the bottom comes out from Republicans, no one is safe. And so I don't think Hager wins, but John Hickenlooper loses in Colorado, or Hager wins and Mark Kelly loses in 
uh, in uh, Arizona, or Sarah Gideon loses in Maine, but she could be essentially brought along by the, by the backdraft or by the tailwind here. Um, so we'll, <clears throat> we'll see what happens. I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that she's able to get over the line finally. Good candidate, really good candidate, but it's a tough slog for her. A couple of last notes before we go to questions. Voter registration in Texas is at an all-time high. <clears throat> that is good news for the party out of power, which happens to be the Democrats now. Low turnout elections are good for incumbents. High turnout elections are good for challengers. My colleague Ross Ramsey says, anger is a greater motivator than joy at election time. And when there are angry people, they turn out to vote in great numbers. That's what happened in 2018. There were pissed off women, pissed off people of color, pissed off young people. It's shaping up to be that in 2020. That is a bad omen for every Republican. On the other hand, the Republicans doing everything they possibly can within the law, working the system to try to figure out how they can counter that. Yesterday, the governor announced that he's going to limit drop-off locations for absentee ballots to one per county. Harris County is larger than Rhode Island. There were 12 drop-off locations in Harris County, and the governor is ordering 11 of those to close. 4.5 million, 4.6 million people in Harris County, one drop-off location. The large counties are significantly impacted by this. Which party do the large counties voters support? Hmm. Right? I mean, come on. This is saying the quiet part out loud. This is a conservative state. Republicans can win elections in a conservative state. If you can't win elections in a conservative state playing fair, then you don't deserve to win. Last observation I'll make is about the demographic change in Texas, which is accelerating. The Hispanic population was fixing to be the largest ethnic population in Texas, not a majority, but the largest ethnic population in Texas by 2022. And they're now saying, actually, it's going to happen in 2021. Do all Hispanics vote uh, in elections? No. Do all Hispanics in Texas vote for Democrats? No. Is it good news for Democrats? Yes, and increasingly. If you like what I had to say today and you believe in the Texas Tribune's public service mission, I encourage you to become a member, texastribune.org slash give. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. And whether it's Kate or anybody else, I'm going to be happy to take your questions for the balance. I think we have till two o'clock, right? So I'll be happy to take questions for the balance of your time. We do. Thank you so much. And we have a good amount of questions being generated sure. in our thought exchange. So I think that'll be great. Um, for those of you who haven't submitted any comments or rated any of those questions, go ahead and jump in the link that Laura just put in the chat box so that you can do that. And that way we're prioritizing what's top of mind for everyone. Yeah. I think Laura will put that up on screen here in just a second too, so that we can kind of see how all of that's shaping up. In the meantime, Evan, I know that one of the questions that was getting some initial um, high ratings was about, let's call it the education wave in 2018. Yeah. So part of the reason that education was so successful in the 2019 session was because of the education voters showing up in 2018. Correct. Do See that influence continuing and, and what are your thoughts on that? I think your premise is exactly right. Elections have consequences. You know, uh, uh, people who cared about public education effectively marched up Congress Avenue with pitchforks and torches. You know, they stormed the castle and they demanded that public school finance be not only a priority, but the priority in the last session. And the outcome of the election in 2018, electing 12 new Democrats to the House. And, you know, Greg Abbott got reelected in 2018, you know, by 13 points. But Dan Patrick's margin was five points, right? I mean, the fact is that you had a lot of elections in 2018 that were much closer than uh, P Republicans in Texas were used to. And they took that as a message from the voters. Go back to Austin in 2019, fix public education finance, and then get the hell out, right? And that's what happened. So I absolutely think that elections have consequences. Here's the problem. The $11.6 cooled everybody's uh, anger about public education. My question is, is the public education voter as motivated coming out of the last session with 11.6 billion uh, uh, invested in public schools? Is the public education voter as motivated to turn out to vote as, as he or she was in 2018? The answer is, I don't know. 
And that becomes a question of whether you guys, broadly defined, can marshal your forces to get your folks turned out. So that's my answer. Sure. So, but let's go ahead and just dive right in. Who would be the Republican, Democratic, or Democratic Speaker of the House? What are your projections or yeah. your thoughts on who's really up there and who's running? Uh, no idea right now. We had a story by my colleague, my amazing colleague, Cassie Pollack, a week or two ago that said, you know, there's a very quiet, it's a very quiet moment for what would ordinarily be a very busy and loud speaker's race, right? Um, I think the uncertainty about the outcome of this election is confirmed by the fact that Republicans are not measuring the drapes in the speaker's office to follow Dennis Bonin in there. I think if, if Republicans had a solid majority that they believed they were going to keep for sure, you'd have a lot more Republicans quietly saying, hey, I think, you know, let's, let's talk about this. But really, nobody knows what's going to happen. A couple of thoughts, Kate. First is, the likeliest outcome here is either a narrow Democratic majority or a narrow Republican majority. And so either way, in that case, we're going to have a coalition speaker of sorts in the sense that a Republican speaker is going to need Democrats to get elected. A Democratic speaker is going to need Republicans to get elected. And they're going to be folks who are more a couple of paces from the center. You know, I would say the chance of Speaker Matt Schaefer or Speaker Steve Toth in a Republican majority House that is 78-76 or 79, um, uh, you know, 78-76. Uh, 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 78, 72, or is, you know, I mean, it's where it's really a narrow, you, 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 I went into journalism not to do math, Kate, so here I am on the fly trying to do this. But you know what I'm saying, if, if the margin, if it's 76, 74, or it's 78, 72, you're not going to see a, 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 a Republican from the Freedom Caucus as the speaker. You're going to see somebody who Democrats get along with. Similarly, if it's 76, 74, or 78, 72 among the Democrats, you're not going to see a, a very far left Democrat, you're going to see more of like a Joe Moody, or you're going to see a, uh, you know, a, a, an Oscar Longoria or something like that. Um, I have my thoughts about who it might be. And again, I'll, I'll come back to something I said earlier, either before our call or now, and that is we live in the United States of overcorrection, right? We have the thing that we think we want, and then we decide actually, no, that wasn't the thing we wanted. We're going to go to the exact opposite side. So Think about Dennis Bonin's personality and temperament. This is not a knock on the speaker, of course, but just think about who he is. In this moment, the reaction of Republicans and Democrats might be to go to the exact opposite point of his temperament. You know, they might want a glass of milk as speaker. And I can think of at least one glass of milk who is a potential candidate for speaker if the Republicans hold the majority. I won't say who it is, but it rhymes with for price, right? Um, and there are probably on the Democratic side things that would, you know, sort of a similar version of that. I think that's the most likely outcome here. Now, the second most likely outcome, not close, is that this is 2010 all over again, but for the Democrats. Remember, Republicans in 2010 were going to win nine or 11 House seats. They ended up winning 22. If the tsunami becomes a Sharknado, and all of a sudden Democrats pick up 16 seats, 17 seats. You're going to see them stretch their legs. Then you see the potential fight between the conservative Democrats who are left in the House and the true progressives. The least likely scenario, I mean, I'd put it at under 5%, is that the Republicans pick up seats and they expand their majority. So I think you're, you're likely to see somewhere in that one option one range where it's really a close, a close majority on one side or the other, and you have a speaker who appeals to both sides, which means a centrist. Thanks. So switching gears a little bit and going back to last session and HB3, mm -hmm. the, the next top rated question is HB3 expanded TEA and commissioner authority over what used to be locally controlled areas. Right. Um, what do you think the appetite will be to address this in the next legislative session? I think yeah. the pandemic has had an impact on-, on Absolutely. This. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to give you an honest answer, which is I don't know. The honest answer is I don't know. I don't want to pretend that I have any special knowledge of this or expertise in this, but I'm going to make two observations. The first is that the pandemic has changed everything, not just this. The before is going to, or pardon me, the after is going to be different from the before right? Even if everything resets to what looks like normal, 
I really think that this period of time, this seven months so far, and however many more months it is, is going to change our thinking about a lot of different things. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that the local control battle is going to be with us always. You know, I always joke that local control has become control of the locals. Well, even the people who don't like uh, mayors and city council members and local officials in charge don't like it until it comes to their community. Then they absolutely want things in, you know, to be done by the locals. So I think there's going to be a little bit of the where you stand is where you sit on this. Um, look, I, I think the, um, the pushback against TEA is, uh, is not new. And um, I would not be surprised to see it as, as a factor of, of, of uh, a fact of conversation or a part of the conversation in the next session. But let me tell you something. The session is going to be bad. And uh, I think people's attention focus is going to be so much on trying to keep everything they've got and trying to, to, to um, you know, where there are opportunities to save the resources in the last budget or to get a couple of few extra dollars. I think the big focus is going to be on the budget. I think that, you know, last session was a public ed session. Everybody wanted it to be their session this time, a higher ed session, a transportation session, you know, what have you. This is going to be a budget session. It's only going to be a budget session. So buckle up. Sure. So in that case, th this next question has to do with charter schools. And maybe this is a question we talk a little bit about how yeah. charter schools might fit into that. But it's been a popular topic. It was a popular topic at SBOE yeah. last week or the week before. Um, legislators have been fairly supportive of charter schools yeah. in the past. Do you see that trend continuing as charters move from urban areas into the high performing suburbs? Of course, fast growth districts, yeah. a lot of fast growth districts are located in that area. And we have seen some concern with um, the issuance of new, the rapid expansion right. and the increasing cost to the state. Yeah, I, I can't imagine why you're asking this. I mean, I, you guys don't care about <laughs> charters, right? You don't give a crap about this subject, do you? Seriously, what do you even care about this? Um, look, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, here's another one where I'm going to say, I think that the, this is going to be a weird session. And a lot of what would be the kind of boring stuff that, you know, is not super civilians facing or public facing, but is kind of the inside argument. I just think a lot of that stuff's going to be pushed to the side. Um, and, you know, in, in the same way that when a court chooses not to address an issue, it reverts to the decision at the, at the court just below that court. If the trend right now is the expansion of charters and the legislature has no bandwidth to really address this issue in a big way or any stomach to address this issue because they're just basically scrambling to do everything they possibly can to keep HB3 as intact as possible, then I think the current trend probably continues there's gonna to need to be a really concerted and focused effort to try to get this trend to reverse itself. But again, in a session like this one, it's gonna be very hard to get people's attention. You, you mentioned a little bit about voter participation yeah. and the increased um, registration. I did. So there are a few questions listed in here, both about voter participation and what you expect to see from that, particularly yeah. among younger populations. Right. but also about the voter suppression yeah. Um, yeah. and that there's concerns about that. So, so right. what are your thoughts on that? Well, let me take the first one first and, and then I'll come back around to the question of suppression. Um, I do think the turnout's gonna be high. You know, again, I didn't go through the numbers specifically, but let me just for the purposes of this discussion say to you quickly, we had 8 million people turn out in 2012 for the presidential election in Texas, then only 4.7 million turn out in 2014 for the midterm went back up to 9 million in 2016 for the presidential. And then we thought it would go back down for the midterm, but it was 8.3 million in 2018. Presidential level turnout, in fact, more than the presidential election of 2012 and 3.6 million more than the presidential election of, of uh, the midterm election of 2014. You know, I thought the pandemic would screw with what was likely going to happen here. I figured we'd have 10 and a half million, 11 million or more based on the turnout last time. And then the pandemic happened and I thought, well, this is actually gonna be a problem. Look, you guys, given everything going on in the world right now, people in both parties, but particularly Democratic Party are going to crawl over glass to vote. 
There is nothing that will happen that will prevent people who want to vote from voting in this election. We in the press tell you every four years, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. No, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. Let me tell you right now, we were lying before. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. And I think voters in this state know it. I think you could have turnout of 12 million. I mean, I, I think you're going to have just a crazy, crazy level of turnout. And again, that's bad for the party in power. Because those people are not all, but are largely people who are pissed and want change. Change is a motivator. And look, with regard to young people specifically, Kate, the uh, Gen Z and millennial turnout in the last election was 508% up from the previous midterm. I think you're going to have young people turning out to vote in droves, 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 droves. And even though a lot of those students were on college campuses where they voted last time, I don't think that's going to be deterred by the pandemic. I think people are going to be voting. Now, on the suppression stuff, I've already told you what I think about the Greg Abbott uh, a plan from yesterday. Um, there is a concerted effort going on in this state and in this country, a concerted effort to, on the one hand, say we want everybody to vote, we believe in democracy, we believe in civic participation, but then we do the exact opposite. You know, we do the exact opposite. We don't do everything in our power to give people the opportunity to vote. And the only way to look at it, the only thing to conclude is that the people in this state who run the state do not want as many people to vote as they say they do. As I said earlier, this is a Republican state. This is a conservative state. You can win elections fairly because it's a conservative state and you have a conservative message. If the state is changing, then you got to change your message. You know, you got to win elections fairly. And for 25 years at the state level or more, that's happened. But I think giving people, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm, very, I'm very concerned that we have normalized these kinds of things. We shrug at it. We go, oh, you know, that's what it is. I mean, we, we published a story yesterday, the headline of which was, I think I showed it to you, basically, Governor, Governor Abbott restricts locations for ballot drop-off, furthering efforts to restrict voting. Somebody said, well, why are you editorializing in that headline. Why can't you just say what he said in his press release, that they're doing it because of ballot security? Okay, I mean, come on. I know what's going on here. You know what's going on here. Let's be honest about it. Let's talk honestly to each other about what's going on here. So there's no question that efforts to try to restrict voting in this state have stepped up as we get closer to election day. And of course, at the national level, we're getting all kinds of wild, unprovable claims about the security of this election. And I have to tell you, it is bad for our democracy. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. When we undermine people's confidence in elections, it is bad for us as Americans. Bad for us as Americans. So on that topic, what we're in a, fair, a, a very divisive place in our country. What yep. is the role of media and news in promoting unity, healing, and fighting division right. and hatred? Well, let me, let me say that I do not believe it is my job to fix this country. I believe it is not our job to come in behind politicians of both parties like the guy behind an elephant with a broom and a dustpan. I do think it's our job to give people the tools to be more thoughtful and productive citizens and to give them what they need to be the guy behind the elephant. It is the responsibility of every single person in this country, every single citizen in this country to demand that our democracy be as healthy and as robust as possible. The media's role is to provide good, reliable, credible information on a consistent basis that gives people what they need to be more thoughtful and productive citizens, to make them better informed and to motivate them to participate civically. We have a positive role to play by doing our jobs and by leaning into our civic mission, our public service mission. I will say that we are flawed like everybody is flawed, and sometimes we don't do that job well. I don't believe in partisan media. I don't believe in editorializing or endorsing. I don't believe in telling people what to think. I absolutely believe in telling them to think. That is the distinction I make. Our job in the media is to give people a reason to think and to take ownership over these issues that affect them in their daily lives. 
it is not our job to fix this country. It is all of our jobs to fix this country. And I think the media has to be a help in that. And, you know, we at the Tribune take our nonpartisan uh, mission, our mission to simply report the facts, not to wear the uniform of any team but Texas, keep our thumbs off the scale. We take that very, very seriously. That is the foundational bit of our mission. Well, we might have room for one or two more questions, but sure. pull out your, your crystal ball here a little bit or based on some of the things that you're hearing. But the pandemic's changed a lot including what the Capitol might look like next session. So right. what are you hearing about how things might look in the Capitol during yeah. the next legislative session? What do you think legislative advocacy will look like? Yeah, it's a great question. It's kind of the big question, isn't it, coming out of the election? Absolutely. I will tell you what the conventional wisdom about this is, which is not the same as saying this is what's going to happen, but I'll tell you what the conventional wisdom is. The conventional wisdom is that you're going to have uh, a legislature that meets in person, but you're going to limit for the first 60 days when you can't actually take up serious business on the floor. It's mostly just, you know, honoring the Little League in Big Spring. The first 60 of those 140 days, I think you're going to have members not really in the Capitol all that much. I think you're going to have very limited staff, only essential personnel. I think you're going to have very few lobbyists, if any, possibly no lobby. I think you're going to have very few, if any, members of the press, the capital, uh, the uh, members of the legislature probably thinking, oh, thank God, right? That's probably their dream come true. Um, and I think you're going to have the public there hardly at all. And I think that it may change the way that bills are heard and testimony is taken and everything else. The pandemic is not going to be over on January the whatever, the second Tuesday of the month when we gavel in and elect the speaker and all that. Let us all, this is a good place to end, Kate. Let us all hope for the sake of our brothers and sisters, our friends and neighbors, that this pandemic goes away quickly. We have a vaccine that we can get back to our normal lives, that we all stay safe and stay healthy. But wishing it away is not going to work. We live in the world that is, not the world that we wish was. And the Capitol and the legislative session, next session, is going to be the world that is. And in that world, we're going to have a vastly different session than we've had ever before. Probably we've never seen a session like this before. And I will say self-servingly, you're going to need the Texas Tribune to tell you what's happening more than ever. So read us, please. And, uh, and I look forward to coming back and seeing you next year. And hopefully one year from now, we'll be in person. Okay? Thank you all so much. Good to be with you. Evan, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of your insights. I know it was, it was appreciated. There was a lot of great energy leading up to this, and, and we're glad you could be here today. Doug, you. do you want to close us out with any closing comments? Evan, I just want to say thank you again. Always love hearing from you. Perspective is wonderful, um, especially in the age of COVID, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, just also want to thank our, our members and our sponsors uh, for this event. Um, appreciate you so much and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you. See you. Thank you, everyone.